Alex, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thanks so much, Sophia. Let's talk about Hussein Jalil's case. Mm. Um, it's been ongoing for so many years. Tell me a little bit about what happened to Hussein. Uh, so Hussein is uh, originally from the western part of China where the Uyghur people live, uh, a Muslim minority that certainly recently has been very much in the news because of an of a absolutely massive crackdown on their rights by the Chinese government, massive incarceration, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's repression that goes back years and decades. Uh, and he was uh, a bit of a leader in the Uyghur community. He was an imam, an imam and was seen as a leader uh, in the community. Uh, and he had had a lot of problems as a result, and he had fled from China. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, he made it to Canada, uh, was sponsored and resettled here as a refugee, um, married uh, a woman originally from Uzbekistan, and, uh, and they had a family, four young children. And in 2006, they were back in Uzbekistan, uh, not in China. They were traveling on their Canadian passports, not Chinese passports, uh, to visit her family, because her family still lived there. And he was arrested by the Uzbekistan government at the, at the request of the Chinese um, and after a couple of months in detention was summarily without any kind of legal process um, sent across the border into China. It was almost like a, an extraordinary rendition. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so, uh, so illegal and secretive. Uh, that was in 2006 and he's been in prison there ever since. How do we know that he's in prison? Because it seems like the Canadian authorities haven't actually had much contact with him. So one of the, the very troubling, complicating factors here is that China has refused to recognize his Canadian citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's quite right. They've never been granted contact consular access. Uh, there has, however, been some information that was coming out for a number of years because his, he still had family uh, in the, the western Xinjiang district of, of China, his mother, uh, elderly woman, um, his sister, and they actually were allowed to have infrequent uh, but occasional visits with him in prison. So mm -hmm. a little bit of information was coming out through those means. Uh, that's all stopped. Uh, it's been about two and a half years uh, since Hussein's wife, Camila, here in Canada has had any news about him. Mm -hmm. uh, and the assumption is that perhaps his family has been rounded up in this massive incarceration. We mm -hmm. know that there's that's over a possible, million yeah. people who have been arrested. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that information flow, which was the only lifeline uh, that there was for Camila in terms of knowing that at least her husband was still alive um, is no more right now, which is very agonizing for her. Mm -hmm. I know Amnesty International Canada has been doing quite a bit behind the scenes for many years. Tell me a little bit about that. So Camila and, uh, and their four boys, uh, some of whom are now young men, because mm -hmm. this has been 13 years. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, were, they were little boys at the beginning, but some of them are into their 20s now, uh, lives in Burlington. And uh, there's an Amnesty International group, a community group in Burlington as well. Uh, and in very early days, they befriended Camilla, and um, and there's a nice relationship, a, a relationship of friendship, of solidarity that has developed over those many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of it is, I think, just friendship and you know, doing social things together. Uh, but certainly also, they have endeavored to to be there for her, provide practical support when it's necessary. It's been very tough raising four young boys uh, on her own, uh, the eldest of whom uh, has some some fairly serious disabilities, so mm -hmm. there's some, some extra uh, care responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, so they've tried to provide some assistance there, and at the same time have been part of the advocate, you know, they've been diligently writing the letters to the Chinese government, writing the letters to the Canadian government, uh, demanding that he be freed, so they, they really pour their hearts into the advocacy also. Mm -hmm. Why does it seem as if this case, you know, is kind of forgotten? Nobody seems to be talking about it much. I mean, we, we have the story of the, the two Michaels in who are now in China, and there's been much media publicity about that, but we don't hear very much about Hussein Jalil. I think that's a very good point, and it's something we've been uh, trying to highlight over the, the last year with this renewed and, and very high-profile attention on Canadians imprisoned in China, mm -hmm. uh, and have been reminding the government and journalists and the public uh, that while it's so important, and it is so important, that we're giving real visibility to, to Michael Spavor and, 
and Michael Kovrig's situation right now um, because it's egregious what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we do also need to remember that there are, and there's actually a, a few other Canadians as well, but Hussein Chalil's in particular because it's so long, 13 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. he's been so forgotten. Uh, and there are very serious concerns uh, about the nature of his prison conditions, his health. Uh, there have always been allegations that he may well have been tortured, especially in early days. There's every reason that his case needs and deserves the same kind of visibility and attention. Mm -hmm. I believe the Chinese officials say that he's there because of security concerns. Can you speak about that a little bit? So China's narrative with respect to all Uyghurs, uh, essentially to be crass, is from the Chinese government's perspective, they're all terrorists. Mm -hmm. They're all security mm -hmm. threats. Uh, and and that's why, for instance, there's, there's this uh, massive incarceration program underway right now, which is mm -hmm. all about indoctrination and brainwashing. Uh, now, the Chinese government, of course, makes it sound all lovely that it's vocational training opportunities and education, uh, but it clearly is not. It's about eradicating culture. It's about forbidding the practice of religion, uh, forbidding and banning the speaking of language. It's, it's really about eradicating what it is to be Uyghur. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always been that narrative. They're a security threat. Uh, they're all terrorists just waiting to mount the next attack. Uh, and that's part of why the Chinese response to a case like Hussein Chalil's is so harsh, so adamant, uh, and why it's so hard to move them. Mm -hmm. What do you think the Canadian government can do? Because it seems like all the diplomatic measures have been taken, but you know, it hasn't resulted in much. Uh, so I certainly do understand and recognize that it has been tough for Canada because China refuses to recognize he's a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. They say he's a Chinese national. Uh, we don't recognize dual nationals in China. Therefore, we're not going to talk to you, Canada. Uh, and that means that they've not responded to any of the Canadian diplomacy. It means they've not allowed Canadian officials to have any consular visits with him in prison. Uh, so that does make it tough. Does that mean that we just shrug our shoulders and say we we tried but China won't listen to us of course not uh, one of the things we've suggested is uh, especially after 13 years what about putting some very careful thought into appointing someone who would be a well-placed influential special envoy of some kind whose whose entire task would be to pursue discussions with the Chinese government around this case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not talking about doing that, you know, publicly, you know, doing press conferences and, you know, pointing the finger and, and saying critical things about the Chinese government, quite the opposite, that this would actually be someone who's well connected, perhaps even from the business world, who knows, mm -hmm. uh, but, but knows people of power and influence uh, in Beijing and would be able to start to pursue a very focused strategy which, number one, would make it clear to the Chinese government just how serious this case is for us. You know, a high-level, influential person totally focused on his case. I think it would... I think it would help China see how serious we are about this case, which probably hasn't been the case so mm -hmm. far. Alex, what advice would you have for people who are watching and who might be thinking, well, what can I do? I feel you know, despondent or you know, upset about what I'm hearing. What can I do now? Uh, well, there certainly is still ongoing activism on his case. Mm -hmm. So people could go to the Amnesty International website, amnesty.ca, um, put in, in the search box uh, Hussein Chilil, C-E-L-I-L, -L, uh, and that would take them right to background uh, information about the case, advocacy opportunities. I know over the years the, the National Council of Canadian Muslims uh, has also been very active on the case and I would imagine they may also have, um, have a letter writing action of some kind up on their website. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, in general, you know, reach out to your MP uh, and make it clear to them that, number one, you're very concerned about human rights in China right now. Number two, you're particularly concerned about what's happening to the Uyghur people. And number three, you're heartbroken to know that there is a Canadian who's ensnared in that exact situation. More and, than one Canadian. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, but in, in particular, one Canadian ensnared in the Uyghur mm -hmm, crackdown mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, uh, and that Canada needs to do more. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, Alex. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a great opportunity. Thank you.